Let's look at a Renaissance side sword. Or is it a rapier? Absolutely unacceptable. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So what we're going to be looking at here, the principal sword we're focusing on, is the Kingston Arms side sword. Or is it a rapier? Well, uh, I want to get that um, sorted out before we go into the video on this specific sword, or indeed the specific type of sword. Um, and the term side sword is a modern one. It comes from spada de lato, but spada de lato just simply means sword at your side, which could refer to any sword. It could be a rapier, an arming sword, whatever. Equally, the term rapier is incredibly, it means different things to different people at different times in different places. I've talked about many times in previous videos. So the problem is that nomenclature or naming of uh, weapons, particularly in Renaissance and medieval Europe, is a very fuzzy topic, okay? So one person uh, in the 16th century may indeed have called this a rapier. Most people just would have called it a sword. Pretty much none of them would have called it a side sword because that's pretty much a modern uh, museum curator's term. However, I am going to refer to it as a side sword because you know what, I'm not a medieval or renaissance person. And people in the modern HEMA community and wider sort of sword community, antique uh, dealing world, refer to side swords as things which are essentially kind of like a medieval arming sword with a complex hilt, but they are not generally speaking as long or as narrow or as thrust centric as a rapier. So when we say side sword, what we basically mean is a cut and thrust sword with some type of complex hilt. So what is a complex hilt? Well, a complex hilt, uh, when I talk about it, at least no, most people talk about it, means something that has additional bits above and beyond what a typical medieval arming sword, that is just with a cross guard and a pommel, have. What does this one have? Well, principally, the first two things that evolved pretty much were this ring at the front and this ring at the back, and they are called finger rings. And you'll notice they're called that because you can stick your finger through them. So uh, if you're fingering the sword, originally people used to do this uh, in just generally with all sorts of swords actually, even all the way back to the Viking era, we occasionally see it in art. But it became particularly popular in the 14th and 15th centuries, particularly with people using sword and buckler, I think, in civilian uh, fencing scenarios where well, they started putting their index finger over the guard. This gives you a bit of extra control. It changes the angle of the grip slightly and makes it easier to use the point, uh, improves point control, can even improve things like uh, reload and redirection uh, uh, for the edge in cutting. So it gives you an extra kind of angle to control the sword with. Now, as soon as people started doing this with their finger over the guard, they needed something to protect it. So finger rings appear right at the beginning of the uh, 15th century, so around 1400, perhaps even the earliest ones in the 1390s. So really early on, earlier than most people realise, we very occasionally, and it seems like probably mostly in Italy and Spain, get fingerings. Such that by the time we get to about the 1450s, 1460s, 1470s, we occasionally see in art a paired finger rings front and back. And these seem to have been particularly popular in parts of Italy and in Spain. And undoubtedly, they were favoured by people uh, who were using swords in war that weren't wearing gauntlets, which actually was most soldiers. So most people using things like a bill or a halberd or a pike or a longbow or a crossbow or a gun as their primary weapon. If their backup weapon was one of these, they couldn't wear gauntlets because gauntlets would impede their use of their primary weapon or indeed they just couldn't afford gauntlets because they didn't have an awful lot of armor. They just maybe had a brigandine, a mail shirt and a sallet, for example. Um, and so their sword, they wanted a bit more hand protection. They had finger rings. Now, one of the next things to appear uh, or even appeared actually about the same time, kind of independently, is a knuckle bow. We don't have a knuckle bow on this particular side sword, okay? So don't worry about the knuckle bow, but you all know what the knuckle bow is. It's the bar that comes around here, like on a saber. They appear also in the 14th century, we could say, for the, for the first time. There were earlier versions, if we go all the way back to the Falcata in the classical world, but generally speaking, in medieval Europe, the knuckle bow appears about the same time as the finger rings, about 1400. Right, now, 
The next thing to appear are side rings. Side rings here protect this side of the hand. You'll notice a right-handed person, when they hold something, most of their hand projects on the right-hand side and not very much of it projects on the left-hand side. So side rings out here, very, very important. The other thing to note, of course, is when you defend yourself with the sword, say if you're defending on your outside line here, the outside of your hand is more vulnerable. And even when you protect on the inside line here, the outside of your hand is still vulnerable. Not to say that the inside doesn't get hit and every Everybody out there who fences like me and who's been hit on the thumb very painfully can attest to the fact that yes, you do get hit on the inside line. We'll talk about that in a second. But predominantly the outside line is mostly what gets hit. And that is why even things like sabres in the 19th and 20th centuries have guards which are bigger on the right hand side than the left hand side. There is another factor and that's wearing the sword. In many ways of wearing the sword, having a projection on the right hand side of the hilt is less of a problem than having a projection on the left hand side of the hilt. And bearing in mind that most swords spent most of their lives in their scabbards being worn around town or on campaign or riding on horses, then having a sword which is comfortable to wear and that means you're more likely to wear it for longer and therefore it's there when you need it, it makes it a more effective sidearm, okay? Right, so we've got side rings. Now, um, when the first, thing, first side ring to get added was this main side ring. They then added another side ring up here which connects the two tops of the finger rings. You notice the finger rings come up here and then they connected another one there because it just, it protects the side of the finger there so that the finger isn't projecting beyond the first side ring and getting hit. So it projects that finger and it gives extra protection in general on the outside here. So you've now got two big bars here which are good protection against cuts and some protection against thrusts as well because of the angles that things come in at. And finally, as far as this sword's concerned, they decided that, oh, the end of your finger there is quite vulnerable and your fingers around here are quite vulnerable and your thumb's quite vulnerable. Let's add in some bars again from the top of the finger rings. So you see the front and back finger rings come up here and they add in two bars that swoop around here and they now protect the inside line. And notice it protects particularly that angle of the inside line because when you're putting a sword in the way of something here or attacking in opposition, if you're buying and winding, then that particular angle is the one that's vulnerable. You're not so vulnerable around the back here, but you are at the front there. So we end up with this kind of cage of protection of bars, and these bars are a very good way of protecting the hand without introducing a huge amount of extra mass or weight to the weapon. Um, you could just go, well, my, why not make a big steel dish or bowl? But that makes the thing quite heavy. So by having these bars, it's a good balance between still having a light and nimble weapon that you can wear conveniently and easily and has still got significantly more hand protection than a simple cross-hilted medieval arming sword does. So we've dealt with the new bits that make this a side sword by modern definition, but there are lots of old bits to this. And it's very important to note that fundamentally a side sword is just a medieval arming sword. The fact that it's got some added bits on, it is fundamentally a 15th century arming sword. The types of blade that we see on side swords very often are exactly the same types of blades that we see on late medieval arming swords. For example, the Type 19 blade. We see the Type 19 blade on Alexandria Arsenal medieval arming swords from the year 1400 or thereabouts. And we see pretty much exactly the same blades a hundred years later, even more than 150 years later, on um, Italian and Spanish and other side swords from, as I say, from a century and a half later, pretty much the same blade. So whilst this particular example is a relatively narrow, relatively light blade, you can find blades like this on medieval arming swords, particularly in the late 15th century, and they just continued in use with a more complex hilt. But Actually, apart from those finger rings and those side bars and this uh, inner bar, you've got a cross guard and you've got a pommel and you've got a short grip. And those things haven't really changed. If you're trying to block out what you can see of the complex part of this hilt, what you're left with is a medieval arming sword. You've got the blade, the cross guard and the pommel of a medieval arming sword just with some added bits on here. The pommel is a type of pommel which became popular again at the end of the 15th century. It actually has its root in 14th century styles of scent stopper pommel. But by this point, this kind of bun shape was very, very popular in the early 16th century. Um, and the cross guards, you'll notice that now we've got a sword which can't be held two ways because it's got an asymmetrical hilt. It's got side 
these side rings on one side and, and different design on the other side, which means that now what they do is they bend one quillon down and one quillon up in so-called S quillons that now protect the hand a little bit better because whilst it's not a full knuckle bow, having that tilted down provides a bit more front protection to the front of the hand. And by curving up at the back, believe it or not, that does provide a bit of extra protection to the wrist and forearm because if something comes down the back of your blade or bounces off the back of your blade, it's more likely to be caught and stopped there. Now, if you think of a sabre hilt, okay, there's uh, some, there we go, let's grab one from behind me. If you think of a sabre hilt, and look, they've still got that rear quill on on the back, just like was evolved with these earlier swords here. So, there's a continuation of design, and of course a continuation of logic, what works, works, and they continue it. So this is the medieval uh, side sword, which is really just a developed hilt version of the, uh, sorry, the Renaissance side, which is a developed version of the medieval arming sword. Now accompanying this slightly new design of hilt and slightly new type of sword, we also see the development of new fencing systems or new tendencies within fencing systems, should we say. And it's very difficult, it's a chicken and egg situation. It's very difficult to say, did the new designs of uh, sword influence the style of fencing? Did the styles of fencing that were evolved design uh, influence the style of hilts? Um, probably it was backwards and forwards and the two things just happened together. So quite simply, if we look at uh, medieval ways of using the arming sword in say the mid 15th century and then we look at uh, mid 16th century ways of using the arming sword or side sword as we call it now um, then there are differences and one of the principal without going into a huge level of detail one of the principal differences is that these swords with more complex hilts start to be held more forwards of the body more of the time okay and clearly if you've got more hand protection that facilitates that you could equally say if you've got more hand protection then you hold the sword further forward because you can so you can see the kind of push pull here you can see which one led which we don't know possibly they both just happen together but as you know from my many videos on um, saber use certainly by the time we get to the 19th century the weapon is kept out in front of the person pretty much the whole time whereas if we go back to 15th century systems the arming sword is not very much held out in front of the person it's held back in these sorts of positions uh, away away from the other person with the hand away now if we look at morozzo or mancellino who are uh, people um, very famous fencing masters who made treatises very popular treatises in the 1530s. So 1530, get that date in mind. If you go back 60 years to 1470, 1470 most people would agree, is in most of Europe still got a very medieval flavor to it. It's still got people wearing full armor on the battlefield. It's still got uh, charges of, of, of heavy cavalry. There's still longbowmen and crossbowmen. There's not so many guns around by that point. By the time we get to 1530, so a couple of generations later, you've now got huge uh, massed ranks of people using forms of firearm, um, handheld guns, um, arquebuses and things. You've got pike blocks, you've got um, lots of artillery on the battlefield, a very, very different type of battlefield. But equally, there's also a different type of civilian dueling culture. When we get into the 16th century, we start to see more and more civilian dueling and more and more fencing schools. And this is true in pretty much every European country. In Italy, um, there had always been a lot of fencing schools uh, throughout the medieval period. Um, and uh, in Germany as well, there were certain fencing guilds, a different kind of structure, different kind of em environment for fencing. But when we get into the 16th century, we see this rapid proliferation of the wearing of swords and dueling culture and fencing schools. And in a place like England, where there hadn't been many fencing schools in the 15th century, in the 16th century we see an explosion of fencing culture from the middle of the 16th century onwards. Um, so the use of swords in unarmed single combat massively increased. Um, now if we look at, as I say, if we look at Manchelino and Morozzo, they're almost a junction point in terms of their system between the earlier medieval styles of using a sword and the later styles of using swords and rapiers um, 
in how they use the sword and what positions they hold it in. So, for example, uh, in uh, Morozzo, you can find uh, you can find guard positions which look very similar to some of the positions we use in Saber. But equally, he has positions uh, down here, for example, and down here, which look very like the positions you see a medieval arming sword or Langmesser uh, used in. And indeed, we still see Dussac used in. So it's not just side sword, we see this in Dussac as well. Dussac being the kind of later successor to Langmesser, you could say, uh, and a predecessor to, to, to Sabre as well. So the fact is that when we're looking at the early to mid 16th century, we see this junction point in fencing style and in the swords between medieval and the age of the rapier, if we call it that. Right, so now on to the review of this particular sword. So this is the Kingston Arms side sword. Now a lot of people have messaged me and also commented under my videos saying, Matt, we want you to review the Kingston Arms side sword. And I had never seen one in the flesh, um, so I got in contact with um, Cass Siberia and um, they sent me one. So thank you very much to Cass. Uh, you should know this has been sent to me as a free sample, uh, but pretty much all the swords that I review on this channel are sent to me as a free sample, so I think you should consider my review relatively impartial. Um, so first impressions, it handles absolutely fantastically. It feels lovely in the hand and it is super quick and nimble. You could move this as quickly and nimbly as uh, any type of saber or um, any type of shorter rapier. Um, it's like a light arming sword and it feels lovely in the hand. It feels very similar, similar actually to certain Chinese jian, even if you hold it differently. Incidentally, you don't have to put your finger over the fingering with a side sword. That is one way. It's the way I tend to hold. It's the probably the most common way of holding a side sword. But we equally know that sometimes they didn't put their finger over and sometimes they held it in a handshake or hammer grip uh, with their fingers all below the cross guard. Um, sometimes they even put their uh, thumb up in certain places. So there's various ways of holding it, but for this video I'll hold it with the finger over. In terms of the ergonomics of it, the pommel's lovely, the grip's okay. I'm not a big fan of, on a lot of Chinese uh, made swords, you get this quite shiny thin chromed leather and it has a modern look to it, it looks a bit like a handbag uh, leather. I can't say I'm a huge fan of that leather. Um, if you really cared about this sword, I'd strip that off and, and put it cord or something else on there. Um, but you know, for its price point, this is a relatively cheap sword. It is what it is. I suspect that will peel off with use, but anyway. Um, the uh, hilt, as I've said, is nice. It's all tight, incidentally, by the way. Um, and it's nicely formed, nicely shaped, and importantly, nicely proportioned. A lot of manufacturers of replica swords in China and India and elsewhere they look at pictures from museums or museum websites and they replicate them but they get the size and the proportion wrong. The, the proportions and size of this is, in my opinion, spot on. If that came from a high-end sword maker, obviously it would have a better finish to it, but in that size and proportion and shape, you'd be completely happy with it. Okay? I don't have any criticisms of that. The size of the finger rings, the size of the side rings, everything else, it's pretty much spot on. One thing I don't like is the leather covering the Ricasso, and I will probably strip that off. It looks like it's been put on as an afterthought. It's a little bit ripply. It doesn't need to be there, in theory. Um, it, I suppose, yes, it makes your finger slightly more comfortable on the front of the Ricasso, but you shouldn't be applying a lot of pressure to the front of the Ricasso there, so I don't think it's really needed. And it, it just looks a bit scrappy. It looks amateur. It looks like someone's done it at home rather than the sword actually being made like that. In terms of the blade, so the blade's got good distal taper, it's super light, it's got a nice and even fuller that uh, finishes in almost exactly the same spot on both sides. It is symmetrical and the end of the fuller grind is nice and tidy. It disappears all the way close to the hilt but not into the hilt. No big problem with a side sword. With a medieval sword, it would should go into the hilt. With a side sword, that's fine. After we finish with the fuller, we come into a flattened diamond section. One minor constructive point, I would say. So the blade does have some rippling. Uh, the mid rib is slightly off center on one side, but it's pretty good on the other side. The mid rib is not very defined. It could be more defined. 
Again, at this price point, it's not a big complaint, just a minor one. And looking up the blade, there is some rippling. Looking along the edge, the edge is straight on both sides. In terms of the flex, it flexes exactly where you want it to. In other words, the first half of the blade is stiff, the second half of the blade flexes. Okay, so all pretty much good with some constructive feedback so far. Now on to sharpness. Hmm, what sharpness? <laughs> it's not blunt, it is a sharp blade, and I suspect that this will, because of its um, edge geometry and the fact that it's light and quick, it will probably glide through water bottles. But it's not really there on the sharpness, okay? So that is a point to be aware that if you want this as a cutting sword, you will probably need to do some fine tuning on the edge, even just with wet and dry sandpaper on a wooden block or a DC4 stone with a Falcon even DC4 stone, which is what I personally recommend. Um, you can easily get that into <laughs> shaving sharp, uh, but you can easily get that super, super sharp, um, but it's just not quite there at the moment. One thing I would also add is the edge is specifically blunt up until about there, okay? So it has about a one, maybe 1.5 millimeter edge up until that point, and it only really has been ground fully to an edge after that. But you can see that I can run my hand along it and not get cut at all. Um, so it's not quite uh, there on the sharpness. But other than that, nice. Now, uh, the scabbard I'll mention briefly. So I love the fact that they give you a scabbard, especially with a sharp sword, because for safe storage, also if you live in a humid place, to protect the blade from rust and things like that, that's great. The scabbard, um, I believe, is made of something like plastic or fiberglass wrapped in leather. So it's not historical, but it does look fairly historical with fiberglass or whatever the modern material is replacing what would originally have been thin wood. Obviously, if you really love your sword, you can make a thin wood core and you can make a traditional scabbard, but this kind of looks okay. Um, and it's got a metal uh, locket and a metal um, chape uh, that look fairly modern. They look like stainless steel to me, um, but they don't, the locket doesn't interfere with the edges of the sword, which is important for keeping your edges sharp once they are sharp. Um, so that's good and it fits well and it stays on well um, and it looks the part, it looks fine. So I think for this price point, that's good. The grip, I believe, is plastic. I don't think it's wood. Now that has pluses and minuses. Wood compresses and I suspect that's why they've gone for, and, and splits as well, and that's why they've probably gone for a modern material. So the grip probably is very, very strong. Now, one thing I have to say is that one of the first things I wanted to talk about with this sword is how the tang was attached, uh, or rather how the blade was attached to the hilt. In other words, what the tang was like and uh, how it's fitted at the end. And I couldn't do that because I couldn't get it apart without breaking the sword. And I don't want to break the sword yet because I want to test the sword. Um, but I found someone on the internet, um, I think it was on Sword Buyer's Guide, SBG forum, who'd actually taken one of these apart because they were, I think, going to use the hilt on a different blade, which is fair enough. These are very useful for DIY projects. Um, and one concerning thing is that this has a tang which is threaded at the end and the pommel screws on. Now I'm assuming that the one that I've got is the same as the one that they have shown. And there is a thread going into this pommel. So this pommel is essentially a giant nut. There is no separate nut. That has some inherent issues. These pommels are usually made of a cast alloy steel, usually essentially equivalent to a stainless steel and they're not particularly hard. That does have the drawback that where the hard steel, carbon steel blade and tang goes into a softer metal pommel that you can strip the thread out of the pommel and you lose, like for example, if you're trying to tighten this up more and you lose the ability to, to do so. That being said, I don't know about the hardness of this particular metal and that may not be an issue in this case. There is a slightly bigger issue potentially and that is the amount of thread going into the pommel. Now, as I say, I can't tell you specifically for this one because I haven't taken it apart because I want to test it first. I may take it apart at some point in the future, but on the pictured example, the thread does not go a particularly long way into the pommel. Now, with a long sword, that can be a big concern because with long swords, people often grip the pommel. With a side sword, you're not actually interacting with that pommel very much, so it's probably fine. It's probably just like having a nut on the end. 
but it's something to be aware of that, that potentially that tang doesn't go a very long way into that pommel. So that could be a weak point, it could be a breaking point, um, and I can't vouch for the strength of this tang, but we are going to test this sword somewhat uh, roughly and see what happens to it. Um, so, um, so let's go and do that now actually, and let's see how this actually performs, cutting up some stuff. So these are copper bottles and the milk bottles and it's a real demonstration of the lack of sharpness of this particular blade. You can probably see the white um, kind of stretch marks essentially on the plastic where it's tried to tear through and in fairness it's gone most of the way through the bottle just by sheer uh, stubbornness and momentum uh, but it's not cut, it's torn its way through um, and that really in this case is not really a fault of the design of the sword, it's a fault of the finish of the sharpness of the sword. Let's have another go with one of these slightly tougher bottles. So there we go again, um, essentially it's just not sharp enough. Um, it's, uh, it's nothing really wrong with my edge laminate, obviously it's, I would say that, but it's, this is purely a case of this edge is not sharp enough to bite into that tougher plastic. Let's have another go though, again this, this edge is just not, it's not biting anything, so funnily enough the back edge, <laughs> the back edge is actually slightly sharper, but I can't really do this kind of cut with the back edge, so let's have another go. Uh, Maybe I'll try cutting a little bit nearer the tip. It feels like it's maybe a bit thinner towards the tip, but not really sharp. But anyway, let's have a go. So I put plenty of um, speed into that and you can see it got through it, but it look at that, it ripped its way through. You've got white scarring here um, and it's torn out the back. So it really, you know, it forced its way through, it didn't really cut its way through. Now obviously when swords don't cut through things, a lot of the energy has to go somewhere. And in this case, uh, we have a slight issue. I don't know if you can see on camera, but the guard is now very loose on the tang. I suspect what's happened is that the, oh no, I can't undo the pommel, but for some reason that uh, guard, if I try and hold it, I'll reach it like that. Can you see that? That guard now has a lot of lateral movement on the, um, on the tang. Um, there was a lot of vibration when I hit those bottles and they didn't go through uh, and now the guard is completely loose on that tank. So I'm going to attempt to see if I can figure out why and see if there's a fix to it. Okay, so I've got to a bit of the bottom of this issue. So this is the leather that I commented on previously that was wrapped around the bottom of the Rocasso where the finger goes over the, or through the finger ring. and. Um, in order to see why the guard had come loose, I needed to take this off. And to be honest, it was already looking like it was gonna fall off soon anyway. So I have uh, ripped it off. It ripped relatively easy. It is leather, it is real leather. Um, but anyway, I think the sword actually looked better uh, without that on. 
Uh, there's a load of glue underneath, it was glued on, so that's what that stuff you can see is. Now, I can now see why the guard has come loose. I think essentially it was glued into place by, uh, because the aperture or hole that the tang goes through is just way too big uh, for the actual tang. So it can just move sideways. It looks to be about two millimeters um, too wide. It's the right depth, so it doesn't move forwards and backwards, but it wiggles sideways on the tang because the thickness of the ricasso or tang is about two millimeters thinner or flatter than the hole is in the guard. So essentially, that guard hole is too big. That needs to be remedied. As it happens, the rest of the grip and the pommel still seems to be completely rock solid. So it's not that the pommel's come loose, it's not that the grip has split, which were possibilities. It is purely because the hole in the guard is too big. And that sword is not unusable, but that is horrible having a loose guard like that, especially when that's a control point with this type of sword, because you've got a fingering, you've got, you've got your hand over the guard. So having a loose guard, that's essentially part of your grip. It's like having a loose grip. Terrible, horrible. Listen to that. Uh, anyway, we're now gonna give this blade a go on some wood. So what I've got here is some um, fresh cut holly. This is actually a relatively short piece from a test I've just been filming before this one. Um, I'm going to do this uh, freestanding on top of my uh, cutting stand and attempt to do a diagonal downwards cut through it. Well, that actually cut fairly well. As we've seen in uh, numerous tests, when you're cutting wood, you don't actually need an excessive amount of sharpness. What you need is good edge geometry. So to cut wood, you need an ax, uh, ideally, um, and, or, or indeed a machete, and it doesn't need to be super sharp. It will cut better if it is super sharp, but it'll still go through the wood. If it's not, it just needs the right edge bevel. Um, and actually, so it went most of the way through here and then did a bit of splitting at the back there. Uh, but very, very clean, no real problem. It's a fast moving blade. And actually, I have to be honest, despite the fact that that uh, loose guard is unacceptable overall, it wasn't a problem for this. Let's have a go with another bit. Do a slightly thicker piece this time. So this might be a little bit hard to see on camera, but we went about 50% of the way through. Obviously a thicker branch this time. We went about 50% of the way through, clean. No real problems with the sword. Let's have another go. So I went through the uh, thicker end that time, and I have to say, to just break it, that's a pretty decent cut. It's not bad at all for a not particularly sharp blade, but fairly good uh, edge geometry. In terms of how the blade is standing up, it's completely straight. There are no, there are no bends at the, at the tang. The grip and the pommel are still rock solid. It's just that problem with the loose guard. What I'm gonna finally do is something that's just a little bit abusive. I'm going to smack my wooden logs a few times um, and this is more just really a test of the sword's strength, of the temper of the blade, the strength of the tang, the hilt construction, this kind of stuff. There we go, I um, wasn't hitting as hard as I could. The guard is even looser now, which I think is probably, I'm not really sure what's causing that. I mean, the, obviously the hole is still too big for the tang. Perhaps the grip has shifted down a little bit, compressed, which left a little bit more space for the guard to move around. The pommel still seems to be rock solid. I understand, as I say, these are threaded in, but they're also glued, I think. So I can't move the pommel or the grip at all. That guard's pretty loose. Uh, the edge 
seems to be seems to be absolutely fine there's no bend in the blade nothing like that still flexes okay I can't see any can't see any chipping or curling or anything like that so it seems to me that the heat treatment on the blade is okay and actually such that it is the construction of the pommel and the grip are fine the problem really is that that guard is too big for the tank so the Kingston Arms side sword I think you'll agree uh, that this review leads to a mixed result um, I would overall put this as showing promise but needing refinement there we go that's my school report for the Kingston Arms side sword on the surface of it when you first pick up the thing you're like wow that's a really nice handling sword there's lots of things they've got right about this sword they've got the distal taper right they've got the general proportions and, and mass and point of balance right they've got the look of the guard the size the pro proportions the finish of it the pommel is a nice shape uh, the length of the grip is not overly long like many replica swords are it's a nice looking sword no question however there are some constructional issues and I'm going to suggest three things three important things that um, Cas Siberia and the manufacturers of the uh, Kingston Arms side sword need to do to make this into a significantly better sword than it is currently number one you need to make sure that when you're selling a sharp sword it is sharp that is at the very least it should do something significant on a piece of paper uh, when drawn over the edge of a piece of paper it should do something to it instead of just glide over the edge this is in no way uh, sharp uh, it, is, uh, it is ground ready to be sharpened but it has not had the final sharpen on it so that is the first thing that needs to be fixed the second thing that needs to be fixed is admittedly slightly anecdotal because I haven't taken this sword apart yet although I may well do um, and that is the construction of the tang particularly going into the pommel so the tang needs to be as beefy as you can make it with nice rounded angles at the shoulder here but when the thread goes into the pommel it's fine having a threaded pommel that's fine uh, I'm not going to criticize that overly um, but it should go at least more than 50% or 50% or more through the pommel um, it shouldn't only just dip into the pommel with a few uh, turns of the thread I understand there are certain industrial um, minimum tolerances for nuts and, and a nut can be very very strong but given the potential for leverage on a pommel, it's a very particular type of thing, given the fact that this is receiving shocks and vibrations because it's being hit against things, I do think that that threaded pommel needs to go at least 50% of the way into the pommel, preferably most of the way through the pommel. So that's the second very important change that I think needs to happen. And last, thirdly, but definitely not least, that after one cutting session is absolutely unacceptable and it's essentially down to two reasons number one the aperture for the tang is too wide which leaves a big old hole now you can fill that with epoxy but at some point especially if people are using these for cutting or even if they make them blunt and use them for drilling the fact is that at some point that epoxy is going to give up it's going to fall out and that is going to get loose and that is completely unacceptable especially on a sword where you have a finger over the guard and this is not just a hand guard but is also a point of control uh, but in any situation that's unacceptable so the hole is too big but moreover you can fix this in two ways number one the hole needs to be the same width as the tang obviously but secondly where the blade goes into the hilt into the guard rather it needs to be recessed okay so if you look at how uh, a well-made traditionally made medieval style sword blade sits into the guard it means that the guard uh, the tang doesn't only go through a hole but the, the guard actually sits around the base the seat of the blade itself as well and if you do that here such that you have a two-stage hole essentially so the top of the blade seats into the guard and then continues with the tang through you will have uh, two points of contact that will make it far less likely that you're going to end up with that shoddy loose guard situation so there we go, I hope this review has been useful. Um, overall, um, it may seem like I'm slating this sword, I'm actually not, I think it's got bags of potential um, and I love the overall proportions and look of it um, and you know I've got to say that the heat treatment the temper everything else stood up to a relatively abusive test but wasn't sharp enough 
you need to rethink how far that thread goes into the pommel and you absolutely need to redesign the casting of this guard so that it fits that tang and that blade more snugly and stays there. Thanks for watching. I have um, extra videos on Patreon, three a month if you're interested uh, and you want to support the channel then consider going and looking at a Patreon linked below. Uh, the link to this product will also be below and uh, if you haven't subscribed please consider doing so and I'll see you really soon again on Scholar Gladiatoria channel for another video. Cheers folks!